The following is a presentation of William Patterson University Television, WPTV. Good evening and welcome to Career Path, the show that brings back alumni to share their success stories. I'm Lexi Cullen Baker. On tonight's episode, we sit down with a former Willie P. Com major who has successfully navigated the sometimes difficult road of trying to make it in comedy. But first, let's take a look at where he got his start. Hi. Hi, thank you. So how many of you guys here uh, watch Looney Tunes? Does anyone notice that uh, Looney Tunes kind of correlates with today's politics? Like, uh, take uh, Bugs Bunny, for example. He's Osama Bin Laden. Now listen to my reasoning. He's in the hole. You know he's in the hole. You put dynamite in the hole, you blow the shit out of the hole. And yet he still manages to pop up and make a bad movie every once in a while. <laughs> and George Bush? Well, he's Elmer Fudd. Shh, <laughs> I'm hunting terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. please welcome our special guest, Late Show with Stephen Colbert producer, Jake Plunkett. Uh, so, material age as well. Yeah. yeah. So what's it like seeing yourself from 10 years ago? It's a little uh, uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, those are some great jokes. I'm, uh, I'm glad I overcame that. Sure, I remember those jokes, yeah. too. Um, so, after seeing that, I have to ask, yep. do you have a Trump impression? No, no. no. Uh, everyone seems to, though. Yes. Yeah, yeah. he's yeah. probably the most impersonable uh, president we've had. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, so we have a live studio audience um, who's going to be tweeting questions throughout oh, the show as well. Um, so remember, you can ask Jake a question by tweeting with hashtag WP career path. Right. Um, so do you find that today's political climate yields for better comedy material? It's, it's a weird thing in that, yes, it's probably the peak of late night right now with uh, just all the stuff that's going on. But it's also probably the most maddening and sad time in comedy right now because we write monologues uh, that we rehearse at three o'clock and by five o'clock he's fired two guys and like threatened war with two countries and we just have to rip it up right and do a new one so yeah it's it's we don't sleep as much as we used to right yeah okay <laughs> none of us have been sleeping no <laughs> um is political comedy part of the balance of power and opinion in this country on par with political news reporting I think it's important. I think, uh, you know, we challenge this administration. Um, there's a lot of noise right now. Cable news is just always yelling, in my opinion. And we're the ones kind of being like, this is what's happening and uh, it's frightening, but hey, we're going to try to comfort you for a minute because tomorrow's coming. So, right. Uh, I, Colbert, especially, I mean, he's kind of found his voice just by uh, reigniting his political fervor and, and trying to comfort the country. Yeah, I agree. Um, what attracts you to political comedy in particular? You know, uh, I've always, I would, I mean, not to be like super dark, but 9-11 happened when mm -hmm. I was 15 years old. Yeah. Uh, and I kind of said that day that I want to know what's happening so I'm never surprised again. And so I got very heavy into politics. And when you get into politics, you kind of just see how absurd it is and how absurd everything is. And it kind of leads you to just, you know, comedy is darkness, in my opinion. And so if you can't laugh at what's sad, then you'll just go crazy. Yeah. And so nothing sadder than <laughs> politics right now. Uh, and that's what we try to make fun of. Yeah. Um, when did you first realize you wanted to be in the comedy entertainment business? I, uh, I gave... Uh, Oh man, it was a, a much lauded performance as Ed Sullivan in Bye Bye Birdie in uh, senior year of high school. That's sarcasm, by the way. <laughs> um, and I remember getting my first laugh and just being like, oh, this is fun. And then you get addicted to it. Yeah. And you just, Absolutely. it becomes a feeling that you chase, a healthy one, you know. Uh, it's not drugs, but uh, it's, it's something that 
to this day, if I have a field piece air uh, on the show and people laugh at it, I'm like, okay, I could keep going. This is fun. And uh, on to the next one. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Great. Um, so when, uh, we have this great comedy and theater program inside the comic department. Uh, what, what role did it play in your formation as a comic writer? Oh, man. Um, I, I, I talk about this a lot. The, my time here formed everything. Uh, we, I got involved in a late night show here back in the day called Lose the Remote uh, with eight of my still closest friends who are all scattered throughout the industry. And we really formed our comedic voices just by constantly mm -hmm. trying stuff and failing and then trying new stuff and then failing even harder, but like slowly figuring out what it is our voice was, uh, how to make something look good. And also just like we made up deadlines for ourselves and we tried to hit them. And when you get into the industry, everything's a deadline. So here is where I just learned to be a really bad producer, a bad producer, yeah. and then a producer. Yeah. And so without this place, nothing. Yeah, I'm not in TV. I'm probably roofing in Staten Island. Um, so when you were a student at William Patterson, did you have any internships in the comedy or entertainment business? And if so, how did they play a role in what you do now? Yeah, I, uh, I interned at uh, MTV, which actually led to my job uh, at MTV. Mm -hmm. I, I interned for MTV for a show called Run's House. Uh, yes. Which was funny in its weird way. But yeah, I, I, my internship at MTV kind of led me into seeing stand-up comedy in New York City and, and kind of falling in love with mm -hmm. that scene. And MTV, luckily for me, created a comedy department a year later. And I was like one of their inaugural members of it. And so I kind of delved head deep into that. And again, without this school and, and this program, I would not have gotten the MTV internship and I would not have gotten that job, uh, which is, I mean, we really ruined that channel, by the way. Like MTV is, oof. <laughs> I am so sorry if you guys like that channel. I mean, name one comedy I did that you guys know about, woof. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's just terrible comedy. You got to fail, you know? You got to fail. Yeah. Yeah, you got to fail. Um, so what is the road that led you to Colbert? And how did you, you know, how did you get that call? That call that, you know, a lot of these kids want to have someday. Yeah. I mean, I've had kind of a crazy career. I started off as a, uh, I guess you guys would know it as like a suit. I was a development executive at MTV. And so my job was to sit down with, with talent and and producers and writers and trying to cultivate their ideas and make it good for MTV and so on and so forth. It took me about four years to realize that I really didn't enjoy that aspect of television. I wanted to be in the nitty gritty. So I created a show for MTV called Nikki and Sarah Live, mm -hmm. which uh, was there for into late night. It didn't do as well as we had hoped as tends to happen. So I went to go work for Regis Philbin and did a sports comedy show which I was on air talent for, which is more uncomfortable than that clip that you saw. <laughs> I was a dancing jaguar. <laughs> and I remember I'd come out and Ray just be like, again with this guy? And I'm like, it's not me. Uh, uh, after that show got canceled, um, I went over to Charlemagne and Friends and did a season mm -hmm. there, uh, did some field producing, and then Saturday Night Live came calling. And uh, I went to their film unit and learned basically a crash course on like big league producing. We, I mean, that schedule is something special in terms of you have a script Wednesday, you have to get something on the air Saturday and yeah. it's high level talent. So for two seasons, I did that. Then I got married and I chose the wife over the show and went to the nightly show with Larry Wilmore. That didn't do so great. Um, after that, I went to Triumph, the Unsold Comic Dog, and mm -hmm. this is where I went to the RNCs and DNCs and kind of got tapped in, re-tapped into political comedy. Uh, and then Colbert liked that work and gave me a call. So it was really just moving around, trying new things, getting all these experiences that kind of made me well-rounded and I guess made myself attractive to them. So, and now here I am two seasons in Yeah, which is great, which yeah. is amazing, absolutely amazing. It's been fun. Yeah. What was the first piece you produced? For, for Colbert? Colbert? So, uh, something called the Halloween Wiggle. Okay. Uh, which was a music video with uh, him doing like a Halloween song and Run the Jewels interrupting and saying very heinous things about Halloween. <laughs> uh, it was fine. It was good. Yeah. But uh, 
when I got to Colbert, it was pre-Trump. We it was mm-hmm. everyone had expected Hillary to win, so much so that we did this live Showtime election special. And we actually produced four field pieces for when Hillary were in. Oh, one. Mm-hmm. We didn't produce one for when Trump won. Uh, and so when he won, we were just like, oh, <laughs> we never prepared for this. Right. And to Colbert's credit, he's like, well, no one's going to want to laugh after that. So it just became him kind of getting drunk on air, which was great. <laughs> uh, we were all getting drunk backstage. Um, but yeah, that, that's basically my first piece. Halloween wiggle into all Trump stuff now. Yeah. You know, right now we have a late night class going on at oh, William great. Patterson. Um, and we're talking a little bit about the submission package that okay. you, you know, have to get get that job. Um, how important is a good submission package, would you find? And, and what goes into having a good package? To be a writer, specifically? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, we take writing submissions once in a blue whenever we have a, a, a slot open. and you get hundreds of writers and we we do them blind so you guys get assigned a number uh and basically if that number is found funny then then you get brought in and you get interviewed and whatnot so yeah i mean those packets are hugely important uh and if you are lucky enough to do one it should take a ton of time never never go with your first joke you should always try to beat your jokes Mm -hmm. that's the most important advice for those writing submissions, we can tell when I'm like, oh, this person wrote this on a whim and, and sent it in. You want to see really structured and producible too. That is the other big thing, mm-hmm. is that we can tell when someone doesn't really have producing background or, sure. or thought about it. Uh, so it's nice when you get a sketch and you're like, oh yeah, we can actually do this. This, this person gets it. Right, Yeah. right. Um, Great, wonderful. We're going to take another question great. from our studio audience. Okay, great. What is something we should be prepared to cut our teeth on while attempting to enter this industry? What is an unexpected reality? Wow, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, what should we cut our teeth on? <laughs> well, I guess I could say that versatility is probably the most important thing in our industry right now. So learning to shoot, edit, uh, even I had to learn Photoshop recently. That is so hard. Uh, <laughs> like just making yourself well-rounded and invaluable. I, the biggest thing that they tell you when you step in the industry is never say no. Mm-hmm. And that's true for the first couple of years. If someone tells you to shoot something, you got to figure out how to shoot it. When I got into MTV in 2008, it was like the beginning of that apocalyptic market collapse. And so they were laying everybody off. Right. And the only reason I think I stayed was because I learned how to shoot and edit in a very short amount of time. And mm-hmm. so they fired the guys that didn't know how to, sadly. Sure. And so making yourself versatile is the absolute biggest key to getting into the industry. And knowing that for the first three years, it's going to be late nights. It's going to be thankless work. But people like me do notice. I mean, we have PAs and interns at Colbert now, and I... I notice the ones that are good and they get yeah. brought back. They, yeah. We don't not notice. Uh, right. It just, it stinks. Yeah. My first job when I was a PA was to build gumball machines uh, for Christmas gifts. Uh-huh. And I built so many damn gumball machines that my hands bled. And I'm really scared that someone ate some tainted gumballs. <laughs> <laughs> like Lauren Conrad may have eaten <laughs> a blood filled gumball for me. And I feel bad about that. Anyway. If you bleed, tell your supervisor. <laughs> I feel bad that I didn't. <laughs> Eight fingers wrapped in band-aids, being like, am I doing okay? Um, so I try to impart on my students that you, want, you don't want to wait to start writing. No. Right, that they not wait for the job opportunity before honing that comedic craft. Yeah. Um, can you give some tips for what these new comics should be doing now? Oh yeah, you should be writing now. Um, your life experiences now will just, you're, like for me, writing is about life and your experiences. And as you get older, your life experiences change, mm-hmm. but your material advances a little bit, but you want to start now so that as you get older, it, 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 you're kind of already finding your voice. Finding your voice is the most difficult thing, as you can tell from my standup. Uh, <laughs> there's not much voice there, it's just kind of like Looney Tunes, right? Um, writing now, especially in today's comedic culture, like there's so much anxiety and, and, and I don't want to say fear, but 
it's a scary time. You guys are going through a scary time right now. And so writing to that, I mean, comedy really is based off of anxiety and fear and, and uh, you know, the darkness. And for you guys to get ahead of that and learn to fail, because you're going to fail so much in your first couple of years uh, and be comfortable with that. I mean, it's why I stopped doing stand-up is I just couldn't get past the failure. Uh, <laughs> People in New York, in New York City, you do shows for like bar crowds that are like 13 people, and you're like, "This is terrible." Yeah. But you got to do it. Yeah. It is the way through, and just learning how to get past that at a young age, it gives you such a start. As opposed to like, there are people my age getting into it, and I'm like, "Buddy, this is going to be tough." Yeah, it it's, is. It's, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. Especially with Twitter and Instagram yeah. and YouTube. I mean, these people on YouTube make videos now that are that like are good yeah 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 you young kids you I know. <laughs> I know all right now that we have another question okay from alex how often were you doing stand-up when you first started good question uh this is a good question i was doing i would say at my peak when i was like 19 20 okay. i was doing like four shows a week yeah and that was in between me working at mtv um and i guess for me i had to choose one route or the other was i going right. to be I think I knew I wanted to be a producer as early as me being at Lose the Remote here because I was great behind the scenes and there are people you could tell that you're like, oh, I don't know if I could ever be as funny as you. But still, stand-up helped because yeah. when you get, if you want to be in comedy in New York City, uh, one thing that really helps is when you, when a comic knows you've done comedy and have ate it a couple times, yeah. there's respect there and they become your people and I mean... It definitely helps with the writers at Colbert. They're like, oh, we could tell you've eaten it a couple times. So I'm like, you bet I have. And so, Badly, yeah. yeah, get on as many shows as you can if that's something you're interested in. Uh, yeah, just experience is super important for that. Yeah, I agree. Great. Okay, we have another question for you Ooh. from Amanda. Okay, what was the most difficult obstacle going through in order to get where you are now? That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna have to think about that for a second. Okay. Time. Okay. Um, you know, again, I think it's just learning to live with failure. You're gonna fall in love with shows that you're on. I remember Nikki and Sarah live. I was like, this show is gonna be important. Right. This is gonna be big. And then, like, the first episode, the reviews came out and it was trashed and no one watched it. And you, it really takes a lot out of you. It, it, it's something that you have to learn to overcome and to keep going forward. And I would say before Saturday Night Live, I worked on uh, like 15, 20 shows that were just one and dones, uh, especially yeah. in this landscape. TV's changing, as you guys probably know. Not as many people watch cable or stream linearly, which might not make sense to you guys, which just basically means most of you guys probably have cut your cable and watch stuff on your phones, mm -hmm. which we quite don't know how to figure out yet. So stuff gets canceled quicker. Um, and so you have to learn to push forward through that stuff until you find a home. Like Colbert is probably the most stable job I've ever had. And it's nice now, but man, it took 10 years of just yeah. constantly being like, is this ever going to work <laughs> to, to get there? Yeah. I mean, comedy, it's a, it's a long road, you know? It's such a long road. Yeah. It takes a while for the payoff, but the payoff's big. Huge. Yes. <clears throat> All right. Can you talk to us about your comedic process? Um, how do you generate your ideas and then turn those ideas into written material? Yeah, sure. Great. Um, <laughs> again, for me, it's it's a lot about like fifth and sixth drafts being the first things you fall in love with, not the first through five. Uh, basically, for me, I'll come. I'll give an example of something that we shot recently. It didn't make air, but it was. I I enjoyed it. I came up with the idea that Groundhog Day should have a sequel. And uh, it's just basically about how we're living in this hellscape constantly. And yeah. So it's Phil Connors being waking up every day watching him at NBC and being like, <laughs> oh, this again is the same day. Uh, I got with the writers and they were like, this is great. We could do this. And basically the first five drafts, Colbert was like, no, guys. It took until like the eighth or ninth draft until we're like, okay, we're still getting it. And then it still didn't get on the air. So I guess that kind of speaks to like my comedic process was like, I really like this idea. By the end of it, we shot it, we liked it, but it still so, wasn't good enough. Right. And so it's, again, learning to live with that failure, which is nice, I guess. I'm discovering now yeah. that I failed, and I still like the piece. So which, sc score one for me. 
which is great. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, we have uh, students. We just came from our sketch class, and they're on their like sixth or seventh draft. And it's important. Yeah, they're looking at me like, please say it's final. I know, but you it's have fine. to beat the jokes. Yeah. I mean, Colbert is in rewrite for three hours a night on a 15-minute monologue, right. and they are just beating every joke to death. Um, and you would think it's laborious, but those monologues are really good. Yeah, yeah. really good. Um, do you have any advice on how to cure writer's block? Uh, uh, <laughs> as I go, uh, um, yeah, I mean, you just kind of got to put pen to paper and just write whatever, write whatever's there. Um, sometimes, you know what's always been good for me is getting with somebody and kind of just mm -hmm. talking through comedic process and the comedic idea, because a lot of times they'll be the one to throw an angle at you that you're like, oh yeah, that is a good angle. And then that kind of gets the block crumbling a little bit right. and then you guys can actually dive deep into it. I've always been more collaborative than others. I know some people like to sit by themselves in notebook a little bit. I'm not that guy. So lose the remote times. It was good to just get eight of us in a room and be like, I think I have this thing about like how central Jersey isn't a real place. Um, <laughs> and you guys feel that way? And then they'd be like, no. And I'd be like, oh, cool. Uh, no, but like that is how it goes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's nice to have a writing partner to bounce stuff. Oh on. my God. Yeah. Yes. It's the best. Yeah. It's great. We have another question about this. Okay. From Jen. Who are our best editors? Friends, family, professors, strangers on the internet? <laughs> Who do we approach to develop oh our voice? Yeah. Um, friend, okay, strangers on the internet, no. <laughs> yeah. That is no. the worst person to go to for criticism because they are mean. They're so uh, mean. Subsequently, I also think friend, uh, family is the worst too because they everything's through rose-colored glasses. Mm -hmm. And I mean, my mom told me I was like the next George Carlin. And I was like, mom, that was like, have you seen that? That's <laughs> So you don't want to talk to your mom about it either. Right. Uh, I think it really is just a mix of things. Like fr friends are always good. I have some really honest friends that mm -hmm. help me a lot. Um, I think you kind of got to pick who your editors are. For me, I always like people who are kind of brutally honest. I'm not someone who loves validation. Mm -hmm. I hate my work constantly. So I don't want someone to be like, that was really good. I want someone to be like, well, I would have done this. I'm like, all right, okay. And that helps me. Sure. Um, because for me, I'm still I'm still learning, so I want someone to help me keep learning, as opposed to someone being like, "You knocked it out of the park, kiddo." Right. Also, why are you calling me kiddo? You know. <laughs> um, yeah. So. I think in this business, you're always learning. Oh, you have to. Ever when stops. I was here, they were shooting on mini DV tapes mm -hmm. that you would put into a, like a machine, yeah. and it was real time. Now you guys have machinery that, like, I'm not 100 percent sure I know how to use, mm -hmm. and so the business is always changing. Yeah. Uh, and so, like, you have to be learning constantly or you become obsolete, which is so right. scary. Uh, but it, it is true. Like, I don't know how to work that thing, that thing. I don't know what the hell's going on over here. Uh, you see, I don't either I don't sometimes. Know, there's, like, questions coming on here. I'm like, how did they do that? Uh, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Ten years seems like not a lot of time for me, but uh, this whole place is different. Yeah. And it's just the whole industry is different. Netflix wasn't around when I was uh, here. And like YouTube started halfway through my college time here, which is insane to me. Yeah. I watched so many cat videos. What was I doing <laughs> before that? Um, but yeah, it's, you just learn to adapt constantly. Yeah, constantly growing, I agree. Um, you know, you, you touched on this sort of idea of, of you know, failing or you know, trying something and it not working. You mm -hmm. know, Lewis Black says you have to bomb 100 times before you can Call yourself a stand-up. It's 100% true. You agree? Yeah, 100% yeah. true. Uh, there is no succeeding without failing. Right. And the failures far outweigh the successes. I am, like, proof positive of that. Um, we, we just got nominated for an Emmy this year. And so that was, like, the first time that I was like, oh, I'm on a show that's doing okay? Because even when I was at SNL, it was the two lowest rated seasons of SNL of all time. Hmm. For a long time, I was like, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I am a curse upon <laughs> anything that I touch. Uh, and you just, it, it does help though, because now that I've done it, I'm like, oh, this, mm -hmm. okay, we, this is validated. This success, it makes sense now because I've learned not to do this and that and that. And it really makes you into a, a good package producer or writer or director. Right. Or all of them. I mean, you got to learn to do you it gotta all. You got to learn to do them all. Yeah. I think you do this day. 
Um, okay, we talked about, you know, I have this other question. It's no secret that getting started in any creative field involves a process of rejection. You yes. touched on that a little bit already. Um, you know, is there one that really stuck out that made you really persevere? Say, okay, no I got to know, but I'm going to keep. Yeah, I mean, there's so much rejection uh, yeah. along the way. It, it was so tough after MTV to get uh, Nikki and Sarah live to get kind of that first real break. It's getting that first break, and Saturday Night Live, I guess, was that for me, but it, I got rejected from every show. Oliver, Seth Meyers, mm -hmm. all of those. I was like, just entry-level jobs I could not get in. And so I think it, there wasn't one big moment of perseverance. It just was like a process of perseverance uh -huh. where I just wanted it. So I was like, I can't go back to roofing. I have to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I got lucky with the SNL thing. I mean, the big thing, another big piece of advice is that networking actually is a huge thing. And so me going out every night and going to these comedy shows and me just getting to know the producers on our set and getting to know PAs and everybody that you can. Someone put me up for SNL without me knowing it. And so I got a call being like, how would you like to work for SNL? And I'm like, ha, 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 hang up. <laughs> and be like, that's a joke. And then right. it turned out to be real. And so it ends up uh, being... You don't think it at the time, but networking really goes a long way. I agree. Getting out, meeting people, who have do the to. same thing. New York City is so mm -hmm. small. It's a, mm -hmm. it's so big as a city, but so small as a TV community. I still get like three emails a day, being like, "Hey, do you know anybody that could like shoot and edit?" I'm like, "Yeah, I do," and I'll give right. a name, and that's how people just keep getting hired. We just circle with each other. Right. That's great. Okay, I think we have another uh -oh. question about this. Okay, from Jen again. Which do you prefer suggest? Abandon the struggling idea for a shiny new one versus finish the project even if it's not your best work? Oh, my God. Oh, no. These questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> abandon the struggling idea for a shiny new object or finish the project even if it's not your best work. Um, I think you have to finish stuff. I'm of that mind. I think if you keep abandoning struggling ideas, you'll never finish anything. Uh, you know, Jordan Peele at the Oscars mm -hmm. uh, really said it well. I'm quoting Jordan Peele now. Um, <laughs> he basically said that, like, Get Out, that was like his 22nd draft of mm -hmm. that script. Like, he was agonizing over it. And he just kind of kept pushing to the finish line. And now, like, to me best picture of the year. I mean, that movie did so many things. Yeah. It took so many chances. Mm -hmm. And I get why, I get how he could sit there and be like, this will never work. Uh, right. But I'm glad he didn't abandon the idea. I'm glad he did struggle it. And even if you don't think it's your best work, sometimes that, sometimes your own, your own worst enemy with that because uh, other people might see value in it that you don't. And that is, that's also important. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Keep going. Just keep going. Yeah. Good. Okay, how important is finding your own voice in comedy writing? Oh, it's, it's the only thing. Yeah. You, if you want to make yourself different from the thousands of people trying it, you have to figure out what your voice is. Um, I, it's funny, we have like 15 writers at Colbert. They're all vastly different. And you know what you, who to go to for what thing. Mm -hmm. If I need like a really sardonic, sarcastic, type of joke we have like the writer who created daria over there i'm like well you could probably handle this right um and if i need some like just a hammered great political comedy joke you mm -hmm. go to someone else um you got to hone that because okay. if it's too nebulous then it just it doesn't stand out right and how is writing for another voice how's writing for someone like colbert different than writing for yourself it's really hard uh yeah it's it you have to kind of, it's almost like being a sports player where you have to study tape on it. Mm -hmm. uh, these guys watch hours of monologue trying to figure out his tics and um, I'll fix this. Oh, this thank you. Louisiana. Do it to you. Um, yeah, it, it's hard. It's also incredibly valuable when you could do it. It's right. 15 writers coming together and creating a voice. You know, Stephen doesn't write all those jokes himself, uh, but it sounds like he does. And so, that's when like everything comes together. 
to really fire on all cylinders. So sure. it is cool when you can do it. Yeah. I can't do it. It's really hard. That's yeah. cool. All right, we have another question. Uh, okay, from Greg. What would be some tips to stand out in a world that is saturated with internet-based content? These are not getting easier. No. <laughs> um, you know, there's no answer to this. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be honest. Uh, we at Colbert struggle with this too. Um, we, the whole thing of trying to create something that goes viral and gets people talking, mm -hmm. there's no formula to it or we would just be putting cats next to Trump all the time and being like, right. this will kill. <laughs> uh, it, it surprises us constantly mm -hmm. what makes people talk, um, especially in late night right now. I mean, guys, there's like 15 late night shows. Yeah. There's like Sam B and Robin mm -hmm. Thede and us and John, Oliver, and what Oliver does is very different from what we do. And they're, I mean, I think there was like a wax museum thing where we all went to Gettysburg and not knowing it, all bid on a wax president. We all came back being like, this is gonna be the greatest piece ever. <laughs> and then like literally that week saw eight different wax figure uh, pieces and none of them went viral. Uh, so we, there's just no answer. I think for me, for you guys, it's the same thing as what we've been talking about, just finding your voice. Right. And then continuously just trying to hone that on the web. Sometimes that gets you picked up. But I would not be going into this thinking, oh, a viral thing is gonna help me stand out. It's okay. just consistent work that will get you to stand out. Yeah. That's such a sad answer, but it's no, true. No, it's true. I mean, should they start thinking about having a presence on the internet? Oh, I think so. I mean, I really hate being on Twitter, but I think it's important to be on Twitter. Right. Uh, and, I, you know, I don't get Instagram, but I know people who are really good at it. Mm -hmm. I post, like, photos of me torturing my wife, and everyone's like, oh. you gotta stop that. <laughs> um, and, like, yeah, YouTube-wise, it's all very important, but there are studies now about how that's changing completely with Facebook kind of doing, I don't want to get into this, this is like super inside baseball, but <laughs> like Facebook has its own algorithms now right. and, and that's changing how we digest video and it just create stuff and get it out there and if it's good, people will notice, but in terms of like one thing over the other, there isn't an answer. It is good to be out there though. Um, Twitter is my favorite medium. Okay. It could get you in a lot of trouble. It can. Why is Twitter your favorite? Um, I found that it helps me engage with people that are like-minded or funny. Right. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like I, I kind of got into Twitter in 2010 and it was kind of young then. It didn't get like co-opted by you know, pol a politician who I will not name, um, <laughs> who has created like, uh, anyway. Uh, but I've met some great people on there and I've collaborated with them. And yeah. I've actually met people on Twitter who I've then been like, you wanna get a coffee and like figure this out and we write and then that becomes something. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's, it's actually been a way for me to hone my comedic voice and I've gotten hardcore on the uh, political comedy thing. Right. And cats, as you. And cats, and well, always cats. I got two of them. Yeah. They're, uh, they're a big part of my comedy. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, can you please tell us what a day in the life of Jake Plunkett at Colbert looks like? I'm waiting for this. Yeah. You, uh, the schedule. You want to hear the schedule? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, so every morning we get in at 9.30 for the writers meeting. Okay. And by 10.30 we kind of got an idea of what the day is going to be like. Uh, by... So 9.30, 10.30 writers meeting. I'd say from 10.30 to 12.30, we're kind of in the, are we gonna show them a field piece to get greenlit? Are we gonna, is Melania gonna come on the show? The woman, Laura Benanti plays Melania. Right. We basically do a lot of read downs for stuff that are bigger. Uh, 12.30, we talk about guest questions. What are we gonna ask Ben Affleck that night? Uh, 1.30 to 3.30, sorry, 1.30 to 3, we tape a cold open for the show. The okay. show always uh, opens with a pre-tape piece, or if Steven wants to be like Tuck Buck for Dead Night, we'll tape something that'll go at the end of the monologue. Okay. And that time seems like it's open, it's never open. That is probably the crash time of our, our day. From three to four, we're then in rehearsal, and we rehearse the entire show. Uh, and then from four to 5.30, we're rewriting it. And so anything you see in rehearsal probably doesn't make the show. It right. gets completely thrown out. 5.30 to 6.30, we tape, and then from 6.30 to 9, we edit. So it's a good 12-hour day, every day. 
every day. And if you have something for me, if I have something in the show, I'm there from 9.30 to 9.30. Uh, if I don't, I get to go home after the show. Okay. Or if there's like a huge bit with like Sigourney Weaver playing a, an alien the next day, I will have to stay and, and talk set designs and all that stuff. So it's just constantly fluid, but you know your checkpoints. Okay, great. And that's every day? Every day. Okay. Fridays, we don't have, we don't tape a show on right. Friday. That's the big secret. Right. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't okay. <laughs> uh, but we do, uh, we get ahead. We shoot field pieces. Okay. Um, this is my first free Friday in a long time. Uh, I've been shooting field pieces basically since the beginning of the year on Fridays or writing to, to shoot the next week. Um, so today I was able to get out at two. I can't believe it. Uh, we're lucky. Yeah. We're lucked out. <laughs> um, but uh, most days we're there until at least six. I, I don't remember leaving before six. Okay. Which is fine. That's great. Yeah. yeah that's no. Nice nine to six. It's great. All right. We have a question again from a student. Okay. From Jekyll and Hyde. Oh, boy. <laughs> How do you figure where the line is drawn for what is okay versus not okay to make jokes about in your comedy, whether it be for the show or for yourself? Um, God, these questions, man. Uh, this is a good one. Yeah. I, I have lines that I won't cross, but that doesn't mean that uh, that is a universal line that right. you can't cross. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, my line is like way out there. Like, I personally think you should be able to try anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you dial it back based on response um, or just based on conscience. Uh, the only thing I don't think is funny is sick kids. I like sick kids to me off limits, which seems like a really radical thing, right? But I've, if someone tells a joke about a sick kid, I'm like, eh, it's too far. Right, yeah. That doesn't mean that's universal. Uh, I've seen comics do like the darkest jokes and I'm like, oh man, that is funny though. That is a good one. <laughs> Um, I mean, when I was in school, again, 9-11 happened. You couldn't do 9-11 mm -hmm. humor at all. And I was at a club, a comedy club the other night, and someone told like three in a row, and I was like, man. Yeah. That was pretty funny, though. <laughs> <laughs> so it, I guess to summarize all this, the line's constantly moving. Uh -huh. I think you kind of got to have your own conscience with it, conscious with it. Uh, Comedy to me, and I don't want to sound too much like Bill Maher here, but it, you should be able to try things. Right. If, if something is sad, the way to kind of get a hold of it is to make it funny, in my opinion, and that's a lot of comics feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, if like people are constantly going, Ugh, maybe you shouldn't do that joke. Maybe it is offending right. people. Yeah. Um, but like some of the great comedians ever told jokes that in their day, you were like, this guy, I mean, People got arrested back in the day for telling jokes that today you'd be like, oh, what? Right. I mean, Lenny Bruce. Lenny, that's the name I was thinking of. Yeah. Marvelous Miss, Mrs. Maisel is a great show about yeah. that. And, yeah. Uh, you kind of find that Lenny Bruce got arrested for stuff that you're like, oh, man, like, I see that in, like, yeah. open mics every night. Yeah. And all that guy gets is another drink. Yeah. 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 That's a 2 p.m. joke. It's that's fun. a 2 p.m. Yeah. joke. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Not a 1 a.m. or <laughs> That's like that 3 9 11 joke. And I'm yeah. like, oh, okay. what's funny, though? Yeah. Um, do you have to learn where Colbert's line is? Yes. Yeah, that was the first six months for mm -hmm. me. Uh, so I worked for Robert Smigel right before I worked for Colbert, and they have very different lines. Right. Uh, Robert Smigel sent a tank into Cleveland during the RNC and was like, you know, as Trump saying, hello, LeBron Jackson, right. and just basically inciting a riot, uh, Colbert much more conservative than mm -hmm. that. So you kind of learn, got to learn what the host likes and what the host doesn't like. And it's even in little things, like some hosts like the awkward silence a little bit more. They like longer takes. They like just you to hold on a frame. Mm -hmm. Other uh, hosts are like, no, let's cut quick. I like, I like the thing to move faster. Um, Larry Wilmore was something. He liked, he liked to, move, to move fast. And Colbert likes to kind of bask in the awkwardness a little bit. Right. And so you got to kind of learn that as a, field producer and a director, um, it's a little bit your vision, but you kind of make the host laugh or it just won't make the air. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, how much of getting to where you are now is hard work? How much is luck? And how important is your social network? You sort of touched on that already. Uh, I'd say it's 90% hard work, 10% luck. The 10% goes into that big break, but 
you don't get that big break unless you're doing the 90% of staying up the latest, being the last one offset. I'm for the first, I mean, I still do it. The first 10 years of my career, I'm of the mind that you're the first one there, the last one to leave. Yeah. Uh, cause that gets you noticed and that helps you learn. Um, and networking, I mean, networking sucks. There are so many times I'm like, I gotta go out to this comedy mm-hmm. show tonight, mm-hmm. but you gotta do it. And yeah. you meet that person who all of a sudden has a drink with an SNL producer and it was like, yeah, I do know this guy. I just talked to him. Yeah. And that's how you get, you stay relevant is you just are constantly in people's brains and they see that your work is good. And so it's kind of like, it's. 70% your work being good, 20% reminding people that your work mm-hmm. is good, and then 10%, oh, I got lucky, someone remembered me, that's my big break. Right. Okay. That equals 100, right? I didn't do the math. Okay. That's why I'm a comedy professor. Yes. The yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope yeah. so. Okay. <laughs> it did. Yeah, it did. It did. It did. It did. Okay. It did. Um, we have another question. Okay. Do you see yourself surpassing producer and trying something else in the field? Yeah, I just uh, joined a director's guild um, like two months ago. So that's that. I think my path is going to go this way now. Uh, I think after this, I'd like to direct some scripted uh, comedy um, and probably get canceled a bunch and then work on something that eventually does really well. Yeah. Uh, This will probably be my last stop in late night. Really? Yeah, I think think I've I've done the late night thing. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Uh, The country could end up going in a crazy direction and I'll end up staying in it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I feel like directing is now my new thing. It's been the passion I found really at Colbert and it's something I want to kind of explore. Yeah, great. But it's good to produce because now it makes you a better director. Definitely. Um, well, you kind of, this was a great question because I was going to say, where do you see yourself going? But now we know. Oh. <laughs> that was my next question. So thank you, Eliana. Um, do you have an ultimate goal though? You know, <sighs> My ultimate goal when I was here was to work at Saturday Night Live, and then I did yeah. that. And then uh, after this has been kind, of, it's been kind of an exploration. Life is weird. Mm-hmm. Uh, everyone's goals that you have now, you get married, things change. By the time you're 31, it's like, what is my goal now? For me, I kind of want to work on a scripted comedy. If right. I could do a Kimmy Schmidt, that would be amazing. Um, and then I probably will do Kimmy Schmidt, and I'll go. You know what I want to do? I want to go into news and go to Syria Mm -hmm. and regret that. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I think it's good to every 10 years to reevaluate what your goals are because you are going to change. Sure. 20-year-old me would have loved to stay at Saturday Night Live forever, but I was there two seasons and I was like, I am so tired. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I really had like this other part of my life that I wanted to explore, which was getting married and... um, it changed things. Now I'm, I mean, Netflix is just, you, there are so many good scripted comedies so on there uh, that I want to explore making people laugh in a narrative way. Yeah. And not in the, oh, you're terrified, but here's a joke. Right. Type of way. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so scared. We have our last audience question. Okay. <laughs> from Jekyll and Hyde again. What is the most prominent thing you would say you took away from the theater and comedy program here at Willie P? Oh, um, I met my closest friends in life at this school, uh, and we forged, I mean, there were eight of us that forged a bond, and of those eight, I would say one's a, a editor of Chopped, the other is a comedy producer who does a bunch of stuff, um, we have production coordinators, we have all this stuff, we were our first eight connections, we were, in terms of networking, we were the first people out there kind of advocating for each other Mm -hmm. and we still do I still recommend people they still recommend me and we get work off each other and like we get to be friends Um, so if I'm if I didn't just involve myself in everything here and dive into what this school offers and it offers more now than when I was here uh, then I wouldn't have had that and I would not have had that leg up on TV Uh, and all those eight people, I mean, I got my friend Mark, who was the host of Loser Mode here. Uh, and if you ever want to see embarrassing comedy, watch an episode of that. Um, he, I was at MTV, and they needed someone who could dub DVDs. Remember those? Um, and I was, like, I was like, Mark could do that. And he did. And then he ended up like running the 
post department there, and now he's like an editor at Chopped. Yeah. So if he didn't have me and I didn't have him, we wouldn't have each other, and we'd be in different places. I don't know if it'd be a Colbert if I didn't have those originally. Right. So it's just good to get to know who your people are and who you want to kind of enter this scary world with because you need that support system. I agree 100% you need a support system. Yes. Yeah. Because it's scary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes the friends who do the same thing are the best support system. Yeah. Because yeah. they're going to, if you know, the best thing about having people in the industry that are your friends is that when you're at a, a shoot at six o'clock and the person, your producer comes up to you and says, you have to uh, work till nine, you could cancel your dinner plans with them. They'd be like, get it. Go yeah. ahead. It's fine. Right. Um, I've lost friends from high school based on the fact that I can't keep a dinner date. And they're just like, dude, you're such a flake. And I'm like, I'm not a flake. <laughs> I'm a professional. <laughs> uh, but that excuse doesn't fly. So you got to find your people. Yeah, great. Um, okay, here's our last question. If you could give your 19-year-old self some advice today, what would it be? My 19-year-old self was a maniac. Uh, I... I would say just cherish the moments. Mm -hmm. um, I've, there've been some really cool things that have happened in my 10 years in my career. And I think you're always kind of trained and, and your instincts are always to like keep looking forward. Mm -hmm. But like, I, I wish I was at the Emmys this year and kind of was like, this is pretty cool. Right. Instead I was, I was just, I was working. I was constantly working. So it's good to smell the roses once in a while. Um, and man, try to get some sleep. It's yeah. so important. It, you, it, uh, you really, you're gonna kill yourselves in the first 10 years. So any bit of time you could take for yourself is super important. Yeah. Um, oh, and it's not the be all end all. I think your first five years, it's gonna, you're gonna globalize a lot and every failure is gonna feel like your life is over. It's not, you're gonna be fine. Uh, as long as you keep your head up and just keep moving forward uh, and Take a, a smell of the roses once in a while, right. you'll be fine. Because um, that first failure is going to suck. It is going to hurt so bad, especially if you're really impassioned by it and like you really care about it. You won't remember it in three years no, after. No, you don't remember it. I, I look back on Nikki and Sarah now, crushed me, mm -hmm. and now I just go, oh, I remember that guy from that show. He's pretty funny. Yeah. He did three 9-11 jokes last night. You right. Know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that, that's kind of how it goes. And my cards. Oh my gosh. We're falling apart here. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, that's, I'm so wise. You are. I didn't know. You're really wise. I didn't know that. You're really wise. Oh my gosh. I should do this all the time. Uh, all the time. All the time. Wow. I feel like at 21 you were wise when I knew you. Really? Yeah. I, you know, at 21 I swaddled a bottle cap and almost died. <laughs> <laughs> So, you were wrong. Oh, I totally misread you. Yeah. yeah. I'm so glad I didn't. I was like, this close. St. Patty's Day. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for of being course. here. Of course. Thank you. Take a round of applause yeah. for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, that wraps up this edition of Career Path. If you would like to see this show or any of the shows produced by our students at William Patterson, search YouTube for WP Comm Department. Till next time, I'm Lexi Cullen Baker. Good night.